ان الحمد لله ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان سيدنا ومولانا محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في القران المجيد والفرقان الحميد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا تقولن لشيء اني فاعل ذلك غدا الا ان يشاء الله واذكر ربك اذا نسيت وقل عسى ان يهديني ربي لاقرب من هذا رشدا وقال تعالى وانا ان شاء الله لمهتدون صدق الله المولانا العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين والحمد لله رب العالمين respected ulama ikram brothers and elders as muslims we know it is our duty to allah that we continuously perpetually preserve our islamic identity this is the duty of every believer and in part of preserving our islamic identity it will be of vital importance it will be of paramount importance that we preserve islamic terminologies in our life in our day to day activities the likes of alhamdulillah subhanallah ma sha allah insha allah it is indeed sad and unfortunate and tragic that gradually whether we realize or not acknowledge or deny the word alhamdulillah from the tongues of some people is phasing away or being substituted by i am fine few years ago i was in australia i spent three ramadans there you speak to an australian the common way of answering how are you no worries so you start speaking to some of our muslim brothers how are you no worries it might look trivial it might look insignificant but let me tell you the hadith of nabi karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam says when a person sneezes as muslims we have been taught immediately to say alhamdulillah if you are in a gathering of non muslims first say alhamdulillah and then by all means you can follow the procedure or the custom provided it does not intervene on islamic principles by saying excuse me or sorry or my apology or i beg your pardon whatever the custom is whatever the word is you will first commence with your islamic way which is your duty to allah alhamdulillah nabi karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam says al utas min allah that sneezing is from allah so when a person sneezes he praises allah and then immediately when he has praised allah those that are around him have been taught that this man has praised allah now you invoke allah's mercy on him and tell him yarhamuk allah which they say god bless you or may you be blessed we say yarhamuk allah may allah shower his choices blessings upon you nabi karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam says in the hadith that person who after sneezing does not say alhamdulillah then o oh muslims that are sitting around him don't say yarhamuk allah for him if he doesn't have the decency of praising allah on this ni'mat of allah and the reason for referring to a sneeze as a bounty of allah it creates freshness in the body while yawning has been referred to the acts of shaitan because it creates laziness in the body the point i'm highlighting here is that the nabi of allah says if he says alhamdulillah then reply him and make dua that allah may shower mercy upon him but if he does not say alhamdulillah then do not say yarhamuk allah Now this is the way a believer should conduct himself that at every instance these as i mentioned in preserving an islamic identity it would be of vital importance that these terminologies are preserved in our homes from childhood the child must be taught when some when a muslim greets you you don't ever say i'm fine how said allah akbar what does it cost you in fact this ummah has been based and referred to as the ummah that praises allah Today I want to focus my entire topic on one word of these words and that is inshallah. I've just touched on the importance of using these terminologies, but the focus of my topic wants to be on one word and that is inshallah, the benefit of using inshallah and the harm of neglecting and omitting the word inshallah in our discussions. Dai'a karima that I recited before you, a typical situation of inshallah. Some kuffar of Makkah came to Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam after they were sent by the Yahud of of Makkah 
that go to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and ask him three questions. If he can answer these three questions, then he is a prophet. And if he cannot answer it, he is not a prophet. So they came to Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam and they said, "Tell us the reality of the soul." Wa yasaluna ka ani ruh, kuli ruh min amri Rabbi. The soul, the human ruh, that it comes in the body and then the person is living and then the soul departs. We don't physically see anything departing. Yet after that, no organ or limb of the body is functioning. So what does Islam have to say about the human soul? How does Islam or Muslims or Allah define the soul in the Quran? First question, ask him. Second thing, ask him about Dhul Qarnain. The man who traveled the east and the west and Allah gave him a kingdom and an empire as vast as the world. What knowledge do you have about this? Now the Yahud had the knowledge of these things in the light of the Torah and the divine scriptures. And this is how they told the kuffar that go and ask this man. If he can answer this, then you must know he has divine knowledge. And if he has divine knowledge, he is a prophet. And the third thing, ask them, ask him about the seven sleepers. Those people, the cave of the seven sleepers who slept for three centuries. These kuffar got happy that today we've got something, we're going to ask this man. And by the looks of it, he won't able to answer. And then we have sufficient proof that he is not a Nabi. They came to Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they posed these questions to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam very calmly said, you come to me tomorrow and I will inform you. They went away and in the process Nabi alayhi wa sallam made a commitment that he will inform them without saying inshallah. The next day when this kuffar came on the appointed time, the Nabi of Allah had no answer. He thought Jibreel will come as is the usual practice of Jibreel. When Jibreel will come, I will pass the question on to Jibreel. In turn, it will go to Allah. Allah will reveal the answer and I will answer. The Nabi of Allah did not say Insha'Allah because of which Jibreel did not come. The kuffar came on that time, gave them an opportunity to now express that you are false, you are fabricating, you're an imposter, you're a liar. On your word that if you can't answer, you're not a prophet, now you don't have the answer. It gave them an opportunity of accelerating, intensifying their opposition. This is creating much pain, agony, restlessness, uneasiness, anxiety in the heart of Nabi alayhi salam. He says, okay, come tomorrow. Comes tomorrow, no Jibreel coming, no revelation. Kuffar, Yahud rejoicing, expressing their happiness. The man is defeated. He is dumb. He cannot answer our questions. To such an extent that according to one rewired, they started passing and leveling accusations and they said it looks like the Lord of Muhammad has forsaken him and abandoned him and this was creating so much pain now Allah does not want to see the pain that his Nabi is experiencing but at the same time the need to discipline his Nabi about the importance of inshallah Riwayat suggest from 15 days up to 40 days Jibreel Amin does not descend the Nabi of Allah is restless. And after either 15 days with the difference of narration, 15 days or 40 days in between, Jibreel Amin descends. And he descends answering all the questions. He answers the question about the soul in the form of Quran. Answers the question about Zul Qarnain, the man who traveled the east and the west. Answers the question about the seven sleepers. And in that same chapter in Surah Kahf, which we commonly recite on Friday, one verse which I recited, Allah admonishes, Allah warns, cautions, alerts his Nabi. وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَلِكَ غَدَىٰ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in future, don't ever make a commitment. Don't ever promise anyone that you'll do anything until you don't attach it with my name and say, pending on the permission of Allah, pending on the aid of Allah, I will be there if Allah so wills. Don't ever make this error again in your life. This is of course the kindness of Allah that He hasn't deprived us of anything by not saying Insha'Allah. When Nabi Karim Sallallahu did not say it once by mistake, the price of that was to discipline Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because Nabi Alayhi Wasallam says, My tarbiyat was done by Allah Himself. That for 15 days there was no revelation. In Muslim Sharif there is one riwayat that Sayyidina Sulaiman Alayhi Wasallam said, La atu fan layla. We commonly speak about, and people ask this question about the aspect of polygamy in Islam. Yahud, Nasara, in Islam, restricted polygamy is permissible. Among the many answers that the ulama have given, 
One answer is that the Nabi of Allah, that is Muhammad sallallahu is not the only prophet that had few wives. In fact, according to this riwayat of Muslim Sharif, which even the Torah and other divine scriptures will admit and acknowledge that Sulaiman had 100 wives. And in this riwayat, he one day pledged and he said, Tonight, I will sleep with every wife of mine. And every one of them will conceive. And every one of them will give birth, this is in Muslim Sharif, every one of them will give birth to a male child. And all 100 of those children will then become soldiers and warriors of Islam. Can we imagine the physical strength of a Nabi to share the bed with hundred spouses in the duration of one night? Nevertheless, he also did not say, Insha'Allah. The result of which was, not one wife conceived. In fact, some wives say one conceived, but she had a miscarriage and the child died. The Nabi of Allah explained in this incident said, I swear by the grandeur of Allah, had Sulaiman said, Insha'Allah, before consummating and before relation and before sharing the bed, every wife would have conceived and a child would have been born to, from, from every woman and every child then would have become the warrior of Islam. You and I have underestimated the value of Insha'Allah in our lives. In Bani Israel, there was a murder that took place. So Bani Israel noted for their deviation and the nature to rebel. They came to Musa والسلام, and they told Musa, Oh Musa, this person has been murdered in our community and we need to identify the murderer. Why not you ask your Allah if he could via revelation or some other way reveal to us who was the murderer. Musa والسلام, told Allah, Oh Allah, these people have a case of murder in, amongst them and they want to know who the murderer is. How should we go about identifying the murderer? Allah revealed the verse, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَىٰ لِقَوْمِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُكُمْ أَن تَذْبَحُوا بَقَرًا قَالُوا أَتَتَّخِذُنَا هُزُوًا قَالَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ أَنْ أَكُونَ مِنَ الْجَاهِنِينَ Allah told Musa alayhi salam, O Musa, tell them to slaughter one cow, and after slaughtering the cow, to take a piece of meat from the carcass from the dead cow, and strike it on the dead man, he will stand up, and admit that so and so has killed me and then he will die again. Musa alayhi salatu wasalam told them that in this lies the cure of what you want. You want to know who is the murderer? Allah says slaughter a cow and then take a piece of meat from that cow, strike it on the dead man and you will have your answer. He will stand up and admit and acknowledge and confess who has killed him. Bani Israel started throwing question upon question. Oh Musa, we are asking you who murdered you talking of slaughtering cows. What's the link? What's the logic? That's the exact translation of the ayat. We're asking you, tell us who is the murderer, you're telling us to slaughter cows. I'm only conveying the message of my Allah. Those of us that feel that Islam runs on our logic, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu used to say, if Islam was based on my logic or your logic, then I would have told you when you wear those leather socks, and it's time to make masa. Logic will say you must make masa of the bottom part because that's getting dirty. But my Nabi said make masa of the top part and not the bottom part. A man is passing wind and he's told to wash his face in wuzu. Musa alayhi tells him Allah says slaughter the cow. Now look at the nature of Bani Israel. قَالُوا أَتَتَّخِذُنَا هُزُوَا قَالَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ أَنَّ نَكُونَ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ قَالَ دُعُ لَنَا رَبَّكَ يُبَيِّنْ لَنَا مَا هِي O oh Musa, you told us to slaughter a cow, but you did not tell us the age of the cow. It's so sad that we don't know. This is the first chapter of the Quran, Surah Baqarah. In fact, the reason that the first chapter after Surah Fatiha has been labeled Baqarah, has been labeled cow, is after this incident. Musa alayhi salam asked Allah, Allah, they are asking the age of the cow. Allah said, Musa, tell them, the more they ask, the more difficult I will make. It mustn't be young, it mustn't be old, awanum bayna dhalik of middle age, but tell them to do what they have to do. Don't ask more things. Musa alayhi salam comes back to them, Allah said, it must be a cow of middle age. Qalad alana rabbaka yubayyil lana ma launuha. Oh Musa, you told us the age, but you didn't tell us the color. Oh Allah, they are asking about the color. قَالَ إِنَّهُ يَقُولُ إِنَّهَا بَقَرَةٌ صَفْرًا فَاقِعُ اللَّوْنُهَا تَسُرُّ النَّاظِرِينَ He comes back, 
Allah Ta'ala says that the, the cow must be of middle age, must be yellow in color, and must be bright, conspicuous yellow, which is striking to, to, to those that are looking at it. They come back to Musa. Oh Musa, there are many cows that are of middle age and are yellow in color. Can't you explain a bit more? قَالُوا دُعُوا لَنَا رَبَّكَ يُبَيِّنْ لَنَا مَا هِي إِنَّ الْبَقَرَ تَشَابَهَ عَلَيْنَا وَإِنَّا إِنْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَمُهْتَدُونَ This is the, 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 the crux and the point that I'm speaking about in this incident. Oh Musa, tell Allah, He must give us, you know, full detail, full explanation. And you know, if you can one time tell it to us properly, Inshallah, we hope this time we will find that cow. On the third instance, they said, Inshallah. The Mufassirin write, if they had not said Inshallah, they would have never had the tawfiq. It was at this juncture, when they said Inshallah, Allah then gave them the ability, and Allah revealed to them the third condition, that it mustn't be a cow that is used for farming purposes. Now because they made it difficult, it became difficult for them, they started looking for a cow, they'll find a cow of middle age but not yellow in color, they'll find a yellow cow but not middle in age, they'll find a cow with middle age, yellow in color, but it's used for farming purposes. Finally they went around looking, and on what they wrong, Allah was planning good in the favor of another young boy who was obedient to his mother. They finally come to this young child who had the cow, and Allah was dictating the description of this cow, knowing that these people will be desperate, this child will make his prize because of his kindness, Allah was going to give him this favor. Look at how Allah works. One side they are rebelling, one side Allah is opening the sustenance of another young child. The point I'm saying is finally they come to this boy. This boy looked at their desperation. He said, how much gold can fit in that cow? That is the price of this cow. They were desperate. They said, have it. That man who owned one cow overnight could owe hundred cows. The ulama say the reason of this was because of he was kind to his mother. The point that I'm stressing here is that the Quran says on the third instance they said, Inshallah. It was because of them saying, Inshallah, they accomplished their task. They slaughtered the cow, took the piece of flesh from that cow, struck it on the dead man. The dead man stood up and he said, you know who has killed me? It has been my own nephew who killed me with the greed of money. He brought me in this jungle, he killed me so that he can claim uh, access over my wealth. He said this and he died. Another incident, just two, three, and I'm only speaking of the word inshallah, the barakat of the word inshallah. In fact, when Musa alayhi salatu was salam was traveling with Yusha ibn Nun, and we commonly say that someone tells us over the fu'al be there, don't worry. Brother Sayyidina Ali radiallahu used to say, Araftu Rabbi bi fasqi azaimi. I recognize the power of my Allah by the breaking of my firm intentions. I pledge, I make a firm resolution, but I see things don't materialize like how I plan. I realize there's some other being controlling my matters. I intend, I commit, I promise, I pledge. But things today when I stand up, it's a different day. Something else goes ahead of me. How I had planned my day, the agenda I had before me. And what the day materializes to me is something else. We commonly say, I'll be there, you'll see me there, don't worry. And before that, we are gone down. Musa alayhi salatu wasalam and Khidr alayhi salam, when they embarked on the spiritual journey, Musa alayhi salam and his nephew Yusha ibn Nun, and Allah told him that take with you a piece of, uh, uh, in a basket, take with you a fish, and the place where this dead fish hops out in a miraculous way, that is the, the place where you will find Khidr alayhi salam, go and sit in his company and learn from him. Musa alayhi salam told his servant that, look here, this is what I have been told by Allah, and I have been given the instructions that wherever this fish hops out, in the surroundings of that place, Khidr alayhi salam will be residing. They went, they came to a certain place, the Quran speaks about this. Musa alayhi salam put his head down to relax. Yusha ibn Nun, the servant that is observing everything, suddenly he sees the fish hopping out of the basket, jumping into the water. He looked at this, he was amazed, and he remembered. Musa alayhi salam told him, wherever you see this, you must tell me. So he said, no, no, no problem, Musa alayhi salam is sleeping, I don't want to disturb. When I get up, I will tell him. When he gets up, I will tell him. He also decided to relax and he fell off to sleep. When they got up, look at the harm of not saying inshallah. When they got up, this person forgot to say. And we, I slept up really, wallah, make me mouth. As simple as that. All excuses now finished. You, you know, I'm justified, so please don't get upset. I forgot, I'm a human. It's, it's, it's common to her. It's, it's a human thing. And all the arguments there. Yes, it is common, we don't deny. But if we can couple it with asking Allah to aid us, inshallah, we'll stop making so many mistakes. We'll be more particular, more, more punctual on our time. He did not say, inshallah, they got up, they resumed the journey. They walked for one additional day. 
Then they finally got so tired and exhausted that Musa alayhi salatu wasalam said, this fish is not hopping out. Why don't you bring some of that fish? Let's eat. Atina ghada'ana laqad laqeena min safarina hadha nasaba. When he said, take out the fish, Yusha ibn Nun said, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raja'oon. Allahu Akbar. You know, yesterday where we slept, you were sleeping, make me mouth. I promise you the fish hopped out of there. Now they had to walk one day going extra, one day coming extra. The reason for this, the commentators write, a very delicate point that when Musa cautioned Yusha that you must tell me, he said, no, that, that's nothing serious. Don't worry, I won't forget. I made a mental note. It's done. The result of that was it costed them walking extra one day and coming back. I end with one incident. We know it is our belief that Yajuj and Majuj, that is Gog and Magog, are behind a wall which was constructed and erected by Zulqarnayn. The Quran speaks about it. And prior to Qiyamah, they will make their appearance on this earth, they will come barging through, and they will cause such chaos that the, the hadith speaks about it, they will kill, massacre, loot. In fact, after that, they will, they will di direct their arrows towards the sky, saying that we have killed the, the inhabitants of the earth, we now want to kill the inhabitants of the sky. Allah will then return those arrows, stained with blood, falsely convincing them that you have succeeded in your endeavor. This wall has been built by Zul Qarnayn. And just to cut a long story short, when he came to this place and he seen these people, and on the other side there was another group of people, those people looked at this king Zul Qarnayn and said that Allah has endowed you with such a kingdom. There are people living on this side of, of, of the road uh, by the name of Yajuj, Majuj. They are really causing mischief and they come, they kill. You don't want to erect the wall, we will pay you so that we can safeguard ourselves against the evil. Zul Qarnayn said, I don't need your money, but you can physically assist me. Inshallah, I will block this and put such a barrier that these people will have no access to you. He then, the Quran explains this, مَا مَكَّنِّي فِيهِ رَبِّي خَيْرٌ فَأَعِينُونِي This wall was then built, and Zul Qarnayn, with the permission of Allah, built such a solid wall that Yajuj and Majuj are trapped behind this wall. Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa says, every day, this is our belief in the authentic ahadith, every day this nation comes to, the, to this wall, which was erected with steel by Zul Qarnayn, and they start opening, and they come so close that they are at the final lap of breaking through and penetrating. When they get to this point, they say that it's too late, let's go back, the next morning we will come. This is false that the world says we have conquered every piece of land and we have discovered every piece of land so there is no piece of land on the planet earth where so and so people could be residing because our technology has reached every piece of land nevertheless they come to this point they say that we we have only so much left we will break it tomorrow and they withdraw and they retrieve and this practice is continuing for months and years Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says they will not succeed prior to Qiyamat on the appropriate time when Allah has decided for this fitna to take place that day they will come and they will do the very same thing break through till it's the last layer left and then they will say inshallah tomorrow inshallah tomorrow we will break it that day they will come succeed on the grounds of inshallah break through and the Quran says they will come barging on this earth وَتَرَكْنَا بَعْضَهُمْ يَوْمَئِذٍ يَمُوجُ فِي بَعْضٍ وَنُفِقَ فِي الصُّورِ فَجَمَعْنَاهُمْ جَمْعًا After it will be, you know, all the final signs of Qiyamah. In essence, it will be through the barakat of Insha'Allah. It's now a debate between scholars. Are they Muslims that will then say this Insha'Allah? Or is it all that are non-Muslims yet through the barakat of Insha'Allah they will get this benefit that they will succeed in penetrating and coming in this world? We make dua to the Almighty Allah. He give us the tawfiq and the ability to use these terms knowledge is in our day-to-day -day activities. Inshallah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, to continuously praise Allah wa ta'ala in every aspect of our life and to do away with other phrases and other forms of greeting. Yes, if we are greeting a non-Muslim, by all means. But how said a Muslim greeting a Muslim? A Muslim sitting in a Muslim restaurant trying to impress one Muslim with the ways of West. How said? The owner of the restaurant is a Muslim. The man eating is a Muslim. The person is trying to impress is a Muslim and is eating with, no, with, fire, with, with uh, fork and knife. Who are we impressing? A Muslim greeting a Muslim, hello, hi. Yes, if a Muslim greets a non-Muslim, by all means. But when it comes to within ourselves, you will find so many other communities, so many other people that they can meet in the center of town. They will be surrounded with different nationalities. They will speak their language, they will greet in their language. Brothers, it is time that this ummah honors and reveres the terms and the identity and the symbols and the signs that Allah has given us. 
who knows preserving and revering these symbols of Islam, inshallah, will keep us, our children, and our generations on Islam. May Allah wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to reflect the Islamic identity verbally, practically, and in every aspect of our life.